Hello, and welcome to Conscious Living, where we air here on 100.5 FM CFRO in Vancouver every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. And of course, you know, we're now out on the interwebs and YouTube and our website and doing things a little differently with video. So please make sure you go check out our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can also watch these video interviews live because sometimes we do have visual components. And uh, today, I I'm actually really excited about our guests today. With Earth Day coming up on April 22nd, on Monday, uh, I've got the pleasure of speaking with Zaya Tong about her most recent documentary, Plastic People. Zaya is an award-winning author, broadcaster, and she's best known for her work with the Discovery flagship show Daily Planet and the Nova Science Now on PBS. She's the author of the best-selling uh, book, The Reality Bubble, which it was shortlisted for Canada's most prestigious nonfiction literary prize and won the Lane Anderson Award for Best Science Writing. Zaya served as the vice chair of WWF Canada and recently serves as a trustee for WWF International. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Well, I'm just really excited to discuss um, you know, basically in the theme of Earth Day, your, your new documentary, Plastic People. But before we start going down that rabbit hole, maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, how you got into all of this great work, you know, um, Daily Planet and the Discovery Channel. So you're obviously a, a keen environmentalist, which is yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's been my passion now for without dating myself over two decades. Um I started at Daily Planet, uh, wow, in 2008, believe it or not, and uh, I got my very beginnings in doing science journalism and broadcasting way back in 2003, believe it or not, when SARS came out and uh, some of the first research was being done out of the University of British Columbia. So I am a Vancouver native, very proud to be, love coming home, and uh, I'm really going to be happy to come back for the screening that we're going to be doing at DOXA as well. So that's the, the short version, and we can get into more of it as you wish. Well, let's start, you know, being Earth Day. Let's start really with what inspired you to do this documentary. You're the co-director of and the host of Plastic People. And I got to say, I had the opportunity to watch it over the weekend before we had this conversation. And I got to say, my mind was blown and wow. not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> um, and the awareness uh, that you are bringing to the the plastic problem that is a global phenomenon in the sense of what it's doing to our planet. So maybe you can kind of pre-frame us for that uh, bit of conversation uh, before we go into the nature of actually what's happening in the world with plastic. Sure. Um, well, I got interested and started following and started investigating the story of plastic Probably in about 2004, I traveled to a place called Matagorda Island in Texas, and I was uh, working for Wired Science at that time. So Wired Magazine had a science show on PBS, and I was following a, um, an oceanographer. His name is Kurt Ebsmeyer, and he was looking at a boatload of plastic ducks that had fallen off of a ship at that point in time. And what he had discovered was because plastic floats, of course, he was able to track ocean currents by following these ducks. So not only was he doing oceanography, but he was also starting to look at the really damaging impacts of plastic. So when I first went to Texas, I went to this beach where, you know, at certain tides, it's just to absolute tonnage of, of plastic waste would wash up onto the beaches. Those, those sorts of scenes that you've come to, to know now, if you're watching you know, a YouTube or an Instagram, we see these you know, really horrific beaches that aren't the beaches where people go on holidays. So they don't tend to get cleaned up every single day like those ones do, right? Uh, so that was you know, when I first got really interested. And then of course I was uh, at Daily Planet for a decade. Every single day on that show, we we focused on what was happening to our planet, our Earth. And I had a chance to 
you know, work with many different scientists and learn from many different scientists over the years. One of the people that we did have on the film um, is Chris Jordan. And Chris Jordan is, is famous for that photograph of that albatross that you saw uh, mm -hmm. in the film. Uh, and I think it's a very iconic photograph. Many people have seen this photo of a bird that basically you don't see any guts in it. All you can see is like what looks like Lego colored, bright colored plastic completely inside of its innards. And these days we're seeing that with animals all around the world. There's, there's, there's especially, you know, um, there's actually a term for it. It's, it skipped my mind for a moment. I, I think it's a gastrolith. I think it is gastrolith. And that's what they're finding inside of camels. So camels, even out in the deserts, in a place where you would not think there would be a ton of plastic, their guts literally it's almost like a, a, a brick of their insides filled with, you know, plastic bags that have kind of been kind of, I don't know, packed in together. Um, we've seen it in fish. We've seen it, of course, in birds. We're seeing it in animals all around the world. So that was something that really um, pissed me off, <laughs> quite frankly, as I think it does many people. But then uh, I started getting more interested in what is happening also to the human body, because we tend to forget that we human beings are, of course, animals. And uh, I was invited to do a plastics panel, to moderate a plastics panel. And that was when I was reintroduced to uh, who is now my old friend, Rick Smith. Rick is the executive producer on this film. And many moons ago, I interviewed him when he wrote a book called Slow Death by Rubber Duck. If you haven't read it, fantastic book. Uh, what he did was he started experimenting on himself. He started, you know, taking you know, shampoos, all these various, you know, odor things that we have, aerosols and the likes um, in the average everyday home. And then he would test his blood. He would test how these chemicals were impacting our body. And so I remembered meeting him all those years ago. And then we met again on this plastics forum and he had just written an article for the Globe and Mail where he had tested his own body for microplastics. And so uh, when the time came after after he had published this article and it had uh, gotten quite a bit of recognition and uh, Peter Raymond, the president of White Pine Pictures, said, hey, Rick, let's do a movie about that. So that's when he reached out to me and said, hey, Zaya, you know, I know you care about this as much as I do. Would you be interested in taking on this project? And uh, we're going to travel around the world, meet with the leading scientists around the world to look at microplastics, which is what I love to do is talking to smart people about big problems and the bad guys. And so uh, off we went and that's how that's how this all started. <laughs> I love how you say how you, you get to talk to all these brilliant people. That's the way I feel by being, you know, conducting these interviews and having conversations with people such as yourself, because you, you bring such a wide range of experience and knowledge um, and it's the way we can bring it all together to share it really with the world, with our community and anybody who is, is looking to learn more about what's happening around the world. And Thank you. That's so kind. I also love being in your chair, being in the I'm not used to being in the in the answering questions chair. I'm usually in the asking questions <laughs> chair. Yeah, hey, I'm just happy to be, you know, doing some great work that can benefit humanity. And we know that our Mother Earth, that Gaia our planet is, you know, it's, she's crying out for help right now. And plastics are definitely a part of that situation. And, you know, when we get, let's kind of start tracking through a little bit of the documentary, because I, I love how, you know, you give a hit, there's a history of where plastics came from, when they came into kind of existence and into, you know, the public consumption model. And, I thought it was really fascinating, you know, because they didn't paint out all plastic is bad. There's there's a good there's place for plastics in, in many areas. But what really struck me was when they decided to make the single use plastics. And it really blew my because it was a conscious decision. Yet they did it for the sake of, you know, capitalism and consumerism yet there is no consideration on the environmental impact, nor on the, um, what are we gonna do with it after, you know, the single use consumption. So maybe you can speak to that and what, you know, A, is being done today uh, that you saw in, in terms of how, 
you know, big corporations and bigger companies and, you know, bigger groups are working to clean up the oceans and the rivers and, and the lands. Yet there's also what can we do as individuals? Because the impact, as we'll talk about some more too, is these plastics are not just in the animals, right? Yeah, no, they're absolutely not just in the animals. And uh, in terms of the impact, I mean, that's what's really, really important for us. And so we have a great opportunity right now to make some changes, uh, especially with what's happening uh, right now, right around now in Ottawa. I don't know if you've heard of the Plastics Treaty at all. I have not, no. Okay, so the Plastics Treaty is good news, a global treaty with just about every country on earth getting together. It's a lot like the Paris Treaty that took place uh, in terms of reducing our carbon emissions. So what these countries are doing is they're getting together to really look at how we can start to reduce plastic usage in the world because it's critical. And you're right. I mean, that's exactly one of the issues that, that we brought up in the film is single use plastics and how absolutely devastating they are, because we talk about it in the film, how there was a marketing strategy, which was the future of plastics is in the garbage can. They knew, OK, we can't keep making this stuff and have it last forever. They knew it was going to last forever. And so if it's going to last, people aren't going to buy new stuff. So how are we going to get people really invested in this? We're going to show them how it can become convenient, how it can save time. But we also talk in the film about a little bit about how we trained people, how we started getting people to believe that single use plastics was the way forward. I mean, as you know, our grandparents didn't use single use plastics. My grandmother didn't have any of this stuff in her house at all and survived absolutely just a-okay just fine so that's part of the good news story is that you know we've done it before just you know a couple generations ago we were living without plastic we can certainly do it again now it's just more about having quality products right having glass jars or having things that you can actually keep i often talk about the fact that um you know we have antiques today simply because we made beautiful stuff <laughs> that we wanted to hand down, but who's gonna wanna hand down plastic crap to their grandkids? Not so much, right? Because this stuff was built to be thrown away. And so really we, we look at that in the film, but the powerful moment that we're in right now is that countries are coming together um, in order to make this change. I'm gonna be heading off to Ottawa and you know, having a chance to meet with some of these uh, delegates at INC4. INC4 is in Ottawa. The next one is going to be in Busan in South Korea. And then by early next year, hopefully this treaty will be finalized. And hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to cut out single use plastics because we don't need them at all. But you're right. For some things, for example, especially for medical purposes, right, for prostheses and the like, fantastic. Use plastic for things that are meant to last for an incredibly long period of time. But using toxic plastics um, for things that are we're just going to toss out and throw away, it's, it's completely, um, it's criminal. It's actually criminal. And I think that's what people are starting to realize. Well, um, yeah, and, and they say that in the film, you know, the conscious decision, and it was a business decision. Um, for this single use, and and I, and I like what what you spoke of about our grandparents, and you know, antiques are around because they were built well. And I think I just want to give people the the you know to open up that common sense part of our minds where we can take a look at you know buying things that last, whether it be plastic or anything, because at the end of the day, we become conditioned and controlled by capitalistic and marketing and consumer driven um, processes to consume more and more and more without any uh, real education or thought or consideration to the waste of it. And that's the other thing too, we wanna, you know, in this film, we were quite keen to not put the blame on the individual here. You know, in the early days in the eighties, we used to always focus on littering which was very, very effective and reduce, reuse, recycle, which as many of us know now, because there have been some investigative reports, the plastics industry came up with this reduce, reuse, recycle, knowing that it was never gonna even remotely put a dent in our ability to recycle all that stuff. So it's basically a kind of scam that allows them to keep 
producing a tremendous amount of plastic. So that is highly problematic, but we don't want to put it just on the individual either, because when you go to like, how are you going to eat? You know what I mean? There are some people I've seen these wonderful activist moments where people say, Hey, this is, you know what I mean? They take the plastic or the garbage to themselves as a point to show people how much plastic we use in a single day. But one of the things, as you know, is I, I travel to Manila and when you go to places in the global South, um, when you're when you're in some of these really, really low income areas, people there can't afford to buy like you and I would be able to afford to buy like a big Costco bulk shampoo that comes in one big bottle. They can't even afford, you know, the twelve dollars or whatever it might be to do that. So instead, people buy buy things in little sachets, little little, you know, little packages. And each one of those little packages is plastic because it's cheaper for them to buy. But of course, it's a heck of a lot more plastic. So that's why that area, especially in Southeast Asia, is littered. But it's not the individual's fault. It is actually the people who are producing all of that plastic who are, you know, and that ultimately comes down to the oil and gas industry, right? These, they're the people who are producing the plastic. And then you have the people in the companies like, you know, whether it's Coca-Cola or Pepsi, who are fundamentally used to be selling their drinks in glass bottles, as we all remember, but now have become massive plastic polluters. So in places like the Philippines, they're starting to enact laws, which are really important, called polluter pays laws. So, hey, if you're a company, if you're a big company and you're bringing in a lot of plastic and you're insisting on selling your product in plastic, then you have to pay for the cleanup. So I think that that is at least a start in, in how we can, you know, wrap our heads around some of the changes that need to take place. Um, but there's one thing I do want to have a chat with you too about, because it's one thing that didn't make it into the film, if I might, and that is about plastic in the, in the food chain. Mm. Well, so, I'm happy to have that conversation because I think it's important. And before we go down that road, uh, I love what you said that it's not the consumer's fault. And, and I agree. And I also believe we all have to take responsibility. And part of that becomes education and coming up to Earth Day, every day needs to be Earth Day, not just one day a year. And we all need to be consciously aware when we make our purchases, where we spend our money, because we do also have an impact where we spend our dollars, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and, and yeah, that's makes sense. the best There's way to vote. Places. There's tons of zero waste places, even in Vancouver. So absolutely, you can use your consumer dollars to support places like that. I agree. Yeah. And that comes with with education. And that's why I, I just kind of going on about that, because I think it's important. You know, we can't change what we don't acknowledge. And we yes. have to start becoming consciously aware that these problems do exist, whether it's you believe in global warming or whatever, all that stuff is about, you know, the separation of that. Our planet needs our help and we have the power to change it. And I, that's why I think this conversation is really important. But let's go back to plastic people and, you know, plastic in our food chain, because in this film, it was pretty impactful what you were showing. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think one thing that we should share with your viewers without giving too much to away or your listeners is that, you know, when I was brought in to do this film, part of this was me testing my own body for microplastics. And, you know, we're all familiar with plastics, but but plastics never break down as, or never basically go away. They do just break down into smaller and smaller fragments and pieces. And so today, many of us are, you know, drinking, eating and breathing these, these microplastics. In fact, right now, you and I are both breathing microplastics in everybody who's listening to your podcast, to your radio show. We're all breathing in microplastics right now. And these plastics are quite invisible because the trick has been hiding plastic. You know, people look at plastic bags at the supermarket and they think, hey, we ban the plastic bags. But they kind of forget about the fact that when you walk through the supermarket aisles, every bottle, every single thing in your supermarket is already wrapped inside of plastic, right? And if we go a little bit further back in terms of the food chain, what is what shocked me as well is knowing that it all starts well before that. Well, but people get worried about the plastic packaging that is, you know, whether it's, you know, what their sushi comes in or what have you, the styrofoam or, or you know, the polyethylene bags or whatever. But in fact, what's crazy is one of the largest releases of microplastic in the world is state sanctioned because what happens is fertilizers 
And a lot of the pesticides come inside of plastic pellets because they want to have timed release of these fertilizers and these pesticides. So we're spreading microplastics all over the fields, for one. The second thing is a lot of the irrigation water, as you know, is filled with plastic. 83% of our drinking water already has microplastics. So that water has plastic. Then you have a lot of the sewage sludge. So because we human beings consume uh, microplastics and animals consume a lot of plastics, what comes out of the rear end of us contains plastic. So one of the biggest sources actually of fertilizer is sludge and that sludge also contains microplastics. So there you have the microplastic from sludge, you have it already from the fertilizers, from the pesticides, and you have it from the water. So think of the soil. Already the soil is just covered in plastic. And that is before we wrap the soil and the farms with sheets of plastic in order to have the crops grow faster. So when people worry about a little bit of saran wrap at the end of the day, they need to think about that whole chain of, of where the plastics kind of got into their system first. So um, to wrap that all up, basically the film is really about testing my body for the plastics that are in my body. So I tested my blood, I tested fecal samples, um, we traveled around the world, we met scientists who were looking at plastic to see if it's in the brain and, uh, and even in the human placenta. So it's, it's shocking when you kind of look at how much this stuff the oil and gas industry has infiltrated the human body. And, um, you know, ultimately, many of us are used to looking out at oil spills and being absolutely horrified by oil spills. But what we're forgetting is that these oil spills today are actually inside of the human body. Oh, well said. You know, and it's, you said a lot right there. So if we unpack that a little bit, um, because I think it's great in the documentary, it shows the breakdown of everything in the soil from the farming perspective, everything gets tilled back into the soil. So all these plastic pellets, so not only, you know, it gets there in our food that way, but how, and then we breathe it, like you're saying, 83% of our tap water has, uh, was a statistic in that you had used in, in the film as well, in our tap water alone. So we're consuming these things through our you know, breathing through drinking, through eating. And then it's all the stuff that, you know, like, you know, you, you're talking about testing yourself. And there's that one line in, in the movie that, you know, I'm not, oh, don't you gonna, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Um, but I thought it was hilarious. Um, yeah. Because it's the things that that we do to find out. And it's what they find in inside you that comes out. And that was just once, if we were actually to go through our whole digestive tract, imagine what's lodged in there, kind of like the albatross, the bird um, that we were referring to at the beginning of our conversation with all this plastic in it. You nailed so it. You nailed it. That was the key thing is like, you know, when I got my feces, my stool sample, that was only a teaspoon's worth right? And that's what, what came out. And so what was scary was thinking about, well, how much didn't come out? And then you look at things like studies that have looked at, um, you know, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, right? And a lot of people have that now. And those people, I, I believe it's 50% more plastic that is found in their, in their guts. So, you know, we know that this has an inflammatory effect. And we know now, even today, you know, heart disease, for example, there was a recent study that came out um, in the New England Journal that was looking at that and the impact of uh, people having strokes and having heart attacks and how much more microplastic was found in their plaque. So it's shocking stuff. And we're starting because the, the science is still really nascent. But it's pointing all of the all of the arrows are pointing in one direction, and that direction is not good. No, exactly. And then and then my question is, what can we do? Like, there's there's things we can do by stop using single use. You know, I think that's the first thing that's the easiest for all of us to do. But what do you think? we need to do in regards to our bodies will we ever get this out like everybody everybody on this planet every animal everything is affected by these microplastics now how do we turn that around in a good way because when you're talking about heart disease and ibs and all sorts of things where our body's been infiltrated for now 
you know, for many of us, multiple decades, what do we do? You know, it's. Well, I think, I think there's certain things that are important to note. Um, and, and it was where I was going, you know, earlier, but we've gone on so many fun, you know, little trajectories. One of the key problems is the invisibilization of plastic. So not recognizing how much plastic is actually in our natural world because we don't see, it doesn't look like plastic. So today, the vast majority of our clothes are plastic, right? All those synthetic clothes, all that sportswear, you go to yoga, everybody's wearing, every yoga outfit is plastic. You know, most sofas and couches are made of plastic. The paint on your walls is plastic. Cigarette butts are plastic. Gum is plastic. So we're not even aware of how much plastic surrounds us. Carpet is plastic for the most part. So what one can do is kind of really look at the what surrounds us, the invisible stuff that we've been tricked into so that you don't have it as much in your home. But in terms of output, um, one one wonderful thing that we can do in terms of, you know, as individuals, and I love this, and this is work that came out of Vancouver as well. Fantastic work that came out of, I believe, the OceanWise team. They actually have a, they have a laundry lab that they have there. So they actually have all these washing machines and they've been testing the microfibers that come off of clothes. And what they've realized is that if you just turn the dial on your washing machine from regular to gentle spin, you know, when it's doing that spin cycle at the end, that reduces, just turn the dial to the left, you know, that reduces the microplastics that you're going to produce by 70%. That's massive. Wow, 70%. 70%. So, yeah, and that's just like the simplest thing that you can do. And so I'm really happy that there are things like that. So like on the on the small level, there's things that people can do. You could also, heck, if you wanted to get a filter on top of it, then you probably caught most of the microplastics. Um, but then if you're not shopping and buying fast fashion, that's going to make a difference. And, you know, the, the great thing is we have people working at an individual level. As a part of our impact campaign, we've got all these awesome uh, NGOs working with us, Environmental Defense, Friends of the Earth, Plastic Pollution Coalition, WWF International, and the list goes on and on and on. All these groups are doing tremendous work, whether it's on microfibers, whether it's in the ocean, all these different areas. So I really hope people come to our website too, plasticpeopledoc.com, because we've got tons of solutions, tons of partners. And then there's the intergovernmental national level as well, where, you know, we're asking leaders to make a difference, whether it's at the plastic treaty or getting your mayor involved. Um, so, so there's tons of stuff that people can do. And, and it's, I'm not nearly, you know, I feel that people can get really paralyzed when it comes to some environmental problems. This is not one of them because we know how to, we know how to live without this stuff for sure, because our grandparents did it. So no problem there. And we also know that, you know, these changes can be made. So banning single use plastic is one of the first things that we need to do. And if we can get that done, then uh, we're going to be on our way. We'll have reduced a tremendous amount of, of the plastic burden. I like that. Well, we do have a the trailer of the video that that uh, we have available. We could play for our audience if that works for you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Stand by. We'll cue that up, and we'll play that out. And uh, for those of you listening on air, and uh, of course, this is a visual thing, so you could check it out on our website at consciouslivingradio.org or our YouTube channel uh, for Conscious Living Network, Conscious Living Radio. And of course, you can just Google it and look at YouTube um, in regards to plastic people. And the trailer is right there. So here we go. Microplastics are possibly the most serious type of pollutant that our society has ever created. I tested snow in our backyard and found tiny fragments of plastic particles. When I came home, I told my children to not catch snowflakes. It's everywhere. You go out into the world and you're going to be exposed to it. Plasticizers have been implicated in various health problems. Heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, fertility problems. We're finding microplastics wherever we look in the human body. We know that humanity is getting sicker. I don't know if there's a direct connection or not, but it's something I want to find out. This is the shit that I do for science, literally. I think everybody has microplastics in their body. Yes. Oh, you're everybody. So like this fiber that we saw here, polyester. I asked the doctor, I said, how come I can't remember my, my child growing up? 
Apparently, she said, that's when you got hit with high doses of benzene. Plastic is like the embodiment of capitalism. It, it made possible the material world that we live in now. They are the bones, the skin, the connective tissue. Virtually every molecule of plastic ever created still exists somewhere on Earth. The plastic never disappears. It just breaks down into tinier and tinier particles. This is soil or plastic? Plastic soil. We are producing poisonous food. We are poisoning ourselves with our hand. Oh, yeah. Look. Was that plastic? I'm still processing the fact that this stuff is really in my body. This is the story of a new world. A world that begins in the mysterious and invisible universe of atoms and molecules. Sir, that was amazing. It just really blows me away uh, in regards to what we see there. Like the, it, It's almost unfathomable until you see it in terms of the amount of, um, you know, just plastic in the rivers and the waterways. And then when they're talking about heart, dis like, again, I just, after watching this film, I was just like, oh my God, what do we do? Because it's everywhere. Yeah, and it absolutely is. So, so what do you think is next to do? Did you see anywhere in your travels that was doing like a really good job as a community country and anywhere that you thought was something that was worth modeling. Well, I, yeah, I'm really, I was excited to visit Manila and I have to tell you, you know, at the end of the film, we show the before and after of what happened to Manila. Um, and so I hope people stick around for the credits to, to see that. And, you know, it's been wonderful because the global South is where we've been seeing a tremendous amount of leadership. We actually focus on Rwanda and looking at how Rwanda actually got the world involved. So it was the Rwandan leaders who were like, hey, we banned plastic bags in 2006 or something like that, or 2008. And I was just in Rwanda and I can tell you, Rwanda is, I swear to you, one of the, like Kigali is probably the cleanest city that I've, I've visited. Like. It's like Singapore, pretty much shockingly clean. And it wasn't just Kigali. I went out into, you know, the villages, also the same, shockingly clean. So places like Rwanda have shown a tremendous amount of leadership. But of course, again, they have to deal with some of those plastics that are still in disguise. But, but they have done a very, very good job. So it was really, really important to us to show how the Global South, because they have so many of those exports, because don't forget when China stopped importing all of that plastic, I think it was around 2018, they said, you know, no more, we don't want the world's garbage anymore. And then the rest of the world went, oh God, what are we gonna do? So we started just putting it into big containers and shipping it, shipping it to other countries. Here in Canada, we got in a lot of trouble because we shipped a big container of garbage to the Philippines and the Philippines sent it back and said, forget this, we're not taking this stuff anymore. We can barely deal with our own garbage. We can't also take your garbage. So it's been wonderful to see that leadership. And um, it's something that you'll definitely see in the film as well. So I'm really excited for your viewers to come check it out at DOPSA, which is gonna be on May 10th. And uh, I'm gonna be there and uh, the whole team is gonna be there. My co-director, Ben Adelman is going to be there. And so we're really looking forward to having a chance to chat with people as well. We've got a 45 minute Q and A afterwards so we can answer all those, all those questions and get deep on plastic. Beautiful. Now, is that a, a premiere then? Is that the full release of, of the, the documentary or is yes, it- Yes, that's right. It's actually the Canadian premiere. We were very lucky to have our worldwide premiere at South by Southwest a month ago. And uh, so we had sold out screenings at South by Southwest and very fortunate. I'm a first time filmmaker. I've done TV for 20 years, but this is my first film. And so we were featured in the New York Times and in Variety. So that was really a big deal for, for little old me. I was pretty excited about that. So it's, it's good that it's getting that attention because this is such a critical issue. And um, yeah, it's a horror movie as well as a documentary. So a horror movie. <laughs> Absolutely. It really is because it gets people thinking. And again, I, I can't help but come back to, you know, some of these health things and that are so much plastic in our bodies. And how do we even 
negate that right from the gentleman in the um in in the trailer where he talks about it you know it's plastic food it's it's plastic soil it's mm. you know, and what does that so then my question is what does it mean for the future of humanity you know if we don't change it if we do change it do you think we'll ever be able to clean it up to a point where you know it we can live a healthier life because even though we think we're you know doing well eating good foods it's still polluting us there too and and in the air and air is the most important thing that we can breathe right yeah absolutely i think that if we don't put a stop on it now we're going to be in a a whole world of hurt there's no question because this plastic you know keep in mind we've made 10 billion tons of the stuff already right and you can't see it anywhere it's invisible so you know uh you know some of it is in landfill but a lot of it is exactly that it's in the air that you breathe and if we keep making as much of it as we are and plastic production is set to triple triple in the coming decades right triple what we already have which is already insane Try to imagine what it's going to be like for children who are being born in that world. The amount of plastic dust that will be around then, because again, it doesn't go anywhere. We made a material that was indestructible for the most part, except for the fact that it just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. So that is exactly what we're starting to see today. So unless we get a hold of the issue now, unless people revolt, literally revolt, um, and we need to, because this is the untold story of oil and gas, right? Oil and gas, it certainly gets a bad rap for the, a lot of the climate issues, but everybody agrees. This is not even a polarizing issue. They've just been doing polls. Everybody agrees, pretty much 85 to 90% of people are like, we have to reduce the plastic, <laughs> you know? It's not, it's, um, it's something that I'm glad, whether you're on the left or whether you're on the right, you can pretty much appeal to, you know, your lawmakers, your MPs and say, hey, we, we've got to make sure that this stops. Because we know that the recycling to the degree that, that we thought it was happening is simply not happening. We've seen, you know, exposés, whether it's been on W5 or Fifth Estate, where they've been looking into this and they go and they track the plastic and you think that they're recycling it. And then you're like, oh, nope, they're incinerating it or they're burying it, or, you know, they're shipping it to other countries. And so this idea of recycling that we had has, has largely been a myth. Yeah, it's really well said. And, and you got me thinking. So this is kind of a crazy question in the sense of, um, because I think it touches on so many things. I, I happen to believe we have the knowledge, the wisdom, the resourcefulness, the ability to change anything we want in this world and when you say that the majority of people all agree about reducing plastic why in you know the creator's name anyone's name are we creating now three times three times the amount of plastic like wouldn't you think we'd be reducing it a third yet well, yeah, yeah, but you know, like that's one of the things we do get into the in the film is like the oil and gas industry knows that they have to reduce oil because of the climate crisis. So they're like, okay, well, what are we going to do? We're going to make more plastic because that's hidden oil. And so, you know, it's really part of this documentary has been about exposing that con so that people can get a little bit pissed off about what's happening because we've been conned. And um, that's, those are the sorts of things that do create change, you know, and we wanted to make a documentary about health because we do know it's like the cigarettes in, in the past. They were like, no, smoking is healthy. Smoking is independent. Smoke because you're a feminist. Do you know what I mean? There's like all these things about smoking and, and, and delaying the science. The same thing that happened with the climate crisis, the same thing that happened with smoking. It's the exact same thing that's happening again. A lot of bad PR and it takes an expose and it takes people seeing what's actually happening to the human body, to the planetary body, for us to, you know, band together and make change. Luckily, as I said, that's happening right now. It's happening as we speak. The only thing is we've really got to put the pressure on our politicians to make sure that it happens right now. Absolutely. And I think it's important that we, you know, act as individuals to start and, and share the information and I, I really want to encourage people to, first off, see this film. It's a must-see because plastic is touching and part of 
everybody's lives, whether you think you're doing a great job or not, the amount of plastic just within our body, you blew my mind. And the the film, I think, really gets the message across. And in a simple way, it's not a like a guilt thing and some crazy extremist perspective, uh, perspective on it. It's logical. It's commonsensical. You know, there's some good laughs in there as well. Um, and, and to encourage others to see this film and to know that Earth Day is every day, not just April 22nd every year. It's a great day to acknowledge and to celebrate, but it's to know that every day that we're consuming plastics that we are not reducing, reusing, recycling makes an impact on our planet. And when we look at the future of our of humanity and the future of the planet, you know, I always say, if we don't take care of Mother Earth, she's going to take care of us in one way, shape or form, because she's going to take care of herself first. Right. Um, and that that's a big thing that I, I always think about. So before we wrap up, uh, Zaya, is there anything else you want to touch on in terms of, and not just necessarily plastic people in this documentary, though this was the focus of our conversation, but in all the great work you've done over the years, what what's your hope for humanity? What's your hope for, for life and people and consciousness as we move forward with all the wisdom that the world has today? Oh, wow. That is such a big question. But I think uh, in almost every way, whether it's a scientific awakening, whether it is a political awakening or whether it is a spiritual awakening, we're living in a time when we need people to really wake up, uh, wake up and see reality for what it really is. Um, I spent I did write a whole book on the reality bubble, which is all about reality and uh, seeing it for what it is, because there are so many veils or so many illusions that we live by. And um, yeah, I, I think that's the biggest call to action that we have right now is to be able to see clearly. Once we can see clearly, then we can we can take action. But I think uh, the problem in the past has always been that uh, things have been hidden from us. They've been invisibilized. They've been behind veils. And that's when we can't act. Right. Because we can't we can't really see what's happening. So clarity first, awakening to action. And uh, then we become incredibly powerful. We've seen it done many, many times in the past, many times in the past. So uh, I'm a I'm a hopeful little bird. Beautifully said. Reality bubble. I'm I'm going to look forward to putting that on my must read list. Thank Is you. there anything specific that you'd like to share in regards to uh, your book as well? Because a reality bubble that could be a pretty big conversation and topic as well. That's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, at one of my favorite bookstores in Vancouver, Vancouver, Banyan Books carries it, which is has been a we great love, honor. To we love Banyan Books. Colin's yeah. a good friend of Constant Living Network and some a lot of the work that we do. So uh, thanks for that. That's a great plug for Banyan, but what a great store. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, just in brief, it's basically about 10 of uh, humanity's biggest blind spots, the things that we don't see. So you know, we know that we live in a world around us that is invisible, whether it's the black holes that are around us or the little invisible demodex mites that live on our eyelashes. There's a whole world that surrounds us that the human senses can't perceive. So I kind of break down all the way in which uh, human beings individually and society has been blinded to the bigger realities that surround us. And uh, again, it's a call for revolution because <laughs> that's pretty much one of my favorite topics in the world. So it's uh, it's all aligned. I love it. Call for revolution. And and it's the strategic revolution as well without being crazy. An enlightened that. revolution. Yeah. I remember Carl Hart had a had said something in regards to that where it's about, you know, strategy and, and doing it right to get the point across and uh, I love what you're saying. I love your work and your your film is fantastic. So I just really want you to know how much I appreciate it on behalf of myself, our community, and to keep doing the great work. Thank you. It's been such an honor. Thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to have you here. So you've been listening to Conscious Living, where we air on 100.5 CFRO FM in Vancouver Co-op Radio. Our guest, Zaya Tong, and her new documentary film, Plastic People. I highly recommend you go out there and see it. And please do what you can. Remember, Earth Day is every day, not just one day of the year. So let's reduce, reuse, recycle, and let's take care of each other. Thank you ever, very much for listening, everyone. And we will see you next time. Bye for now.
What a pro, right?